Good evening and welcome to episode 10 of our Garden State's Microdose monthly webcast. Our final one for 2021 and what a year it's been. Um, thank you for being with us uh, over the year of, uh, of webcasts, joining us here online since we haven't been able to uh, join in person um, for such a long time. But we are working towards uh, an in-person event. Um, originally, we were hoping to do that just a week ago, two weeks ago. Um, when we did our live 12-hour epic webcast, thank you to everybody who joined uh, joined for that. Thank you to everybody who bought a raffle uh, ticket for that. Uh, it was a really uh, special event. Now, I'll, I'll jump into that in a second, but I just want to uh, uh, note that I'm broadcasting here from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and would like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, we recognise that uh, we benefit from knowledge and insights of First Nations people here in Australia. And if anyone's joining us from outside, of Australia, um, Indigenous peoples, uh, and First Nations people uh, from around the world as well, including uh, often their long relationships with uh, that first technology, plants and fungi. And that's the sort of thing we're going to be talking about today. Uh, my name is Nick Wallace and uh, I'm the co-founder, oh, that's Twitter, uh, of the Australian Psychedelic Society, uh, currently heading up the Melbourne chapter. Um, EGA is uh, closing in on uh, 20 years of um, operating as an organisation, um, providing uh, opportunities for critical thinking and knowledge sharing uh, on psychedelics, essentially an interface uh, between the community and this uh, this body of knowledge, whether it's uh, represented by uh, uh, people who have had that knowledge for a long time, people who are researching that knowledge, uh, people who have um, some kind of uh, cultural engagement with that knowledge. Uh, all of those things, EGA brings it all together um, and, uh, and, and, and has really been... Uh, at the forefront of Australian's, uh, Australia's psychedelic community for over 20 years. And I want to just quickly uh, recognise and thank, we'll do a little bit more of this later since it's the end of the year, um, all the work of the EGA volunteers behind the scenes. A lot of work goes into making these things happen, uh, getting raffles together, uh, maintaining websites, getting YouTube videos together, um, and, and building networks with people, which is the most important work uh, that EGA does. Um, so thank you to everyone, but we'll, we'll cover a little bit more of that later. Uh, so we are live tonight again um, if you do have questions or comments uh, as we're moving along drop them in that chat and uh, we will get to them our moderators are in the chat and are there to help you um, make sure as well to uh, sign up for the EGA monthly newsletter that's where you can stay up to date with all future events uh, that will be coming from EGA including information about December in 2022's in-person Garden States event anyway touching wood everything will be fine in December 2022 um, and we will see you in person for the Garden States event uh, so stay up to date with that in the meantime we are going to have monthly webcasts continuing throughout 2022 uh, and you can find out all of that here at Entheo genesis.org forward slash connect while you're at the website as well grab some of those resources uh, there are an ever-growing bunch of resources um, at the website um, this one here that you can see is um, one of the uh, mushroom ones the psilocybe uh, <laughs> psilocybe so this was the garden states event again uh, available to everyone who attended on youtube uh, and you'll be able to find that information in our most recent email out if you're not if you have signed up and you're not finding them, check your junk folder and make sure uh, that it is whitelisted. Um, also, uh, a, a little project that EGA is working on in the background, and there will be more information about this in the coming weeks and months, is a uh, is an NFT project. Uh, well, there will be an NFT of this project that will be made widely available, and it is a... Uh, a visual uh, chart that will help people to uh, understand the different psychoactive uh, effects and interactions of a whole range of plants and fungi. And this is just some of the examples of the artwork from it. And we'll move along and have a look at some more. Um, I think that was the same ones. Uh. It says something slightly different. So if you're reading along, there you go. Um, and if you have seen the Tripsit chart, which I'll ask our moderators to drop a link to the Tripsit chart into the YouTube uh, comment section, then it's sort of like uh, that Tripsit chart, uh, which has been a really useful uh, resource uh, for engaging people in conversations, um, in harm reduction, in, in some of the work that I do. And I know that a lot of people uh, love that resource as well. 
Um, yeah, so that's that's a really good one. And then finally, before we get into tonight's content, um, I want to let you know that uh, January's webcast uh, tickets are now available for that. Um, and this is the uh, event flyer for it. Uh, we'll have Dr. Ross Watts, Dr. Stephen Bright and Melissa Warner. It's a bit of a PRISM special. That's Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine um, with uh, both Dr. Stephen Bright and Melissa Warner from PRISM. Um, and it will be uh, on Psychedelic Nature codes, which uh, sounds a little cryptic at the moment. I suppose that's what psychedelic nature codes are meant to be. Um, but you'll be able to find out more information about that at the link, uh, which I'll also ask our moderators to drop that uh, link into the uh, into the chat. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight and thank you for sticking through um, a whole bunch of housekeeping and uh, information uh, that I have had for you. Um, here is the EGA Twitter, by the way. If you are on Twitter, uh, then this is just some of the uh, information that you'll be able to, uh, able to see there. Um, it's really good uh, if you are somebody that is involved with social media, if you can jump on there and do things like retweet, comment on things, uh, keep these conversations going uh, online in between events because it really uh, it, it just helps uh, in general. So really appreciate that. Uh, so our main speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Alistair McTaggart. Uh, Alistair is a research fellow for the Centre for of Horticultural Science um, at the University of Queensland, studying the evolution of fungal pathogens with a focus on rust and smut fungi. Uh, he has completed postdocs in Africa, America and Europe and has started new research uh, direction for UQ, uh, studying the biodiversity of native psychoactive mushrooms in Australia. Uh, but before now I have a six-year-old asking me something, so I'm going to introduce uh, Alastair McTaggart. Uh, Alastair is our main presenter uh, for this evening. As I mentioned before, research fellow at the uh, fellow at the Centre for Horticultural Science uh, at the University of Queensland. I'm literally talking right now. I'm sorry. Hold on. Uh, he studies the evolution of fungal pathogens with a focus on rust and smut fungi, um, uh, and has completed postdocs in Africa, America, and Europe. Uh, Australian uh, magic mushrooms have evolved unique genetic pathways for production of psilocybin. Uh, uh, and confirm endemicity, ooh, endemicity of our native taxa. Uh, Alistair will establish a living collection to safeguard genetic diversity and provide a platform uh, to research the applications of psilocybin uh, in human health. Uh, Alistair, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Alistair here coming at you from Mianjin, from the lands of the Yagara people. And I think, um, Nick, you inspired me to add a little bit more to your acknowledgement. Um, as we are lovers of mycology and fungi, um, I think we can acknowledge the knowledge held by our Aboriginal Australians and their uses of fungi for foods, medicines and biomaterials. Now, I don't have 60,000 years worth of knowledge in um, mushrooms by any means, but for the last 15 years, I've been studying fungi as agricultural pathogens, so specifically smut fungi and rust fungi, which are two really unreal groups, both related to mushrooms in a way. They're in the same phylum, um, Basidiomycota, but they're in two separate subphyla. Uh, and at some point in time during COVID, I think I had a little bit too much time to reflect and I decided I wanted to shift that my skills, which are in fungal genetics and genomics and taxonomy, that's not really a, I can't really go and be a fireman. I've got a very small niche and I thought, well, what can I do? And I decided to work on fungi that actually help people instead of fungi as the bad guy. And it has been so refreshing to, to get into this kind of field. So I'm also working as uh, on fungi as edible and poisonous mushrooms. And I'm really mindful that there's a large community of people so interested in psilocybe and magic mushrooms. And so I'm just trying to be as open as I can. And anything I do, I just put on this blog uh, science wise. And you're welcome to send me an email. Lots of people do or read the blog if you want to know what I'm up to scientifically. It's fun on a bun. Um, so what made it all happen? is this permit. Can you believe it? I, I got one uh, within three to six months. I can't really remember the time. It was much more smooth than I thought. And I think that's just because of my background. They saw, okay, well, this guy legitimately wants to study the evolution of magic mushrooms. Let's work with him to get a permit to him. And so Queensland Health, I think the, the legislation is changing nationally, but at the moment, Queensland Health administer my permit um, and you can see, you can, 
if you can't read, then I'll tell you a little bit about it. I can have up to 150 mushrooms at any one time and 500 cultures. And this is just too much. It's given me, uh, I, I don't need that amount. So as cultures, um, as I finish working on them, they just go into the herbarium and they'll last in there for forever to my knowledge, uh, you know, centuries. So they're stored indefinitely physically having mushrooms. I don't really need them at all. Um, because I'm working with cultures all the time. So getting the permit, there's so many gray areas about working on, on these scheduled compounds. And cause I was working on the, the mushrooms that produce it. And the first question is how much psilocybin will I be using? And I just said, well, I don't know. Uh, I've got no idea. I probably some, maybe none. And in fact, all of the cultures that I work with probably don't really have any psilocybin because I'm working on haploid cultures. So cultures made from a single spore that only have um, one copy of each chromosome. We're going to get into that later. So but unlikely to produce any psilocybin. And so this kind of gray area, we're going to have a little bit of a meeting with Queensland Health next February. A few people from the community get together to try and make it easier for people who do want to start working on this a little bit more and just to bring us all together because we do need to come together to get critical mass. Uh, so yeah, as long as I'm at the uni, this permit is valid, but I do work in a herbarium and we probably can work on these kind of, on magic mushrooms um, without the permit, but because I just want everything to be above board and totally open, I think it's a safe way to go with the permit. So, and I should, yeah, the herbarium has records of psilocybe in there from many, many moons ago. Um, and now just a little bit about me. So, and the project, it's extra year of funding. And I'd proposed that I was just going to work on psilocybe. So they said gro groovy, like they've given me four days a week that I can do research. I still have to work on my other agricultural projects. Um, but I have the freedom to work on which is just, uh, so, so refreshing. It's really cool. There's no money associated with the project. So everything I do is just based on kind of parallel projects with agriculture and creatively kind of saying, okay, well, I'm sequencing these genomes, just going to throw a couple of magic mushroom genomes in as well, because it's just such an insignificant cost to add more to a genome sequencing run. Or if I'm making culture plates, then I'll just have extra culture plates made up for magic mushrooms. And then all travel is just me jumping in the car and cruising around Southeast Queensland, which is starting to become the bottleneck as you'll, as you'll see. So unfortunately I couldn't hear Kane's talk at all, but no doubt you all have your finger on the pulse of the mushrooms that I'm working on. So because I'm working on populations, as much as I would love to study every single species of psilocybe, when you're working on populations, you do kind of have to narrow things down because you have such large samples. So I'm talking about probably I want to look at more than 200 haploid cultures of Psilocybe subaruginosa and maybe with a question on Cubensis, probably around 50 or so. So if I was trying to do that with every single species of Psilocybe, it would just get out of hand. So when I'm working on a population, I probably only want to choose... Uh, a couple of taxa. And in this case, I've chose what I think Kane probably just told you is an endemic species, Psilocybe subaruginosa, and then our most likely introduced species, Cubensis, which it's possible it was here growing out of diprotodon manure in our macrofauna rich substrates many moons ago, but that's probably a little bit less likely. And so I'm sorry if I'm repeating information from Kane's talk here, but what was keeping me awake at night is the story of the Hawaiian peanut, which is the macadamia nut in the United States of America. So Hawaiians uh, came and took genetic stock of macadamia and they started producing macadamia better than we did in Queensland. And they have since bulldozed many of the forests that macadamia grew in natively and now delightful sugarcane plantations grow there instead, which is just fantastic, right? Um, so we've lost a whole bunch of genetic diversity that Hawaiians have and South Africans have, and the nut is known as the Hawaiian peanut. And I kind of thought that this was happening with, with our native magic mushroom. So Kane probably mentioned this was described in 1927 by Cleland, J.B. Cleland. 
Uh, he just grabbed it from a few locations in Australia. And then 20 years later, Psilocybe cyanescens was described from the Botanic Gardens at Kew out of wood chips. And as a general rule, Australian mycology is lagging behind the Northern Hemisphere just because we lack critical mass to an extent in that kind of taxonomic space. So it's really a good indication that where our Psilocybe subaruginosa grows, so in rainforests in Queensland and down into northern New South Wales, and then this photo was taken by a citizen scientist in Tasmania in grasslands, all in native substrates, and, of course, it does occur in wood chips in uh, kind of planted garden beds. But because it occurs in the natural environment and it was described in 1927, compared to Psilocybe cyanescens, which exclusively grows in uh, cultivated environments in the Northern Hemisphere, including the UK, uh, Germany, uh, all the Western states of the United States, it's a really good indication that it's probably a native here. And cyanescens, which many suspect is a synonym of this, is probably an escapee at some point in some sort of mulch or whatever. Okay, sorry if I've covered extra information there. So two taxa, those are the two. Um, and my research questions really are about whether they're native to Australia or whether they're introduced. And this is, so with Psilocybe subaruginosa, there's a whole can of worms that opens up. Uh, I think just back to that macadamia nut story, we've got an act in Queensland called the Queensland Biodiscovery Act where if there's a taxon that's native to Queensland, especially if it can be linked to traditional use, but even if it's just native to Queensland, usually if someone wants to commercialise it, then they have to enter a benefit sharing agreement with the Queensland government or the landholder on which it was collected. So this is uh, kind of huge news, especially if Psilocybe cyanescens is, is, uh, is a relative or the same conspecific with Psilocybe subaruginosa. So I think it was when I first read Psilocybe cyanescens in a patent, which was just for extraction of psilocybin, I was kind of like, oh, okay, this is interesting. So I did want to, I want to show that it's endemic. I shouldn't say I want to. I want to test a hypothesis that's endemic to Australia, which we strongly suspect will support that hypothesis. And so what you'll see in a matter of minutes is why we're taking a population approach. So... Kane probably, well, Kane definitely mentioned Psilocybe australiana, australiana, tas, no, australiensis tasmaniana eucalypta. Is that it, Kane? Are you nodding? Yeah, <laughs> something like that. So we've we've got a species complex in that Psilocybe subaruginosa. So whether it's one panmictic population, which means that if I've collected something in Queensland, somehow it's still exchanging spores with Tasmanian uh fungi in Tasmania, so a panmictic population that's outcrossing um, in, the, in recent history, or whether there's since been kind of speciation in different pockets. And so you'll, a fancy way of saying speciation is maybe when we're talking about uh, a population is saying structured. So what's the boundary that separates our populations? And then are those populations no longer outcrossing with each other? And should we actually recognize more biodiversity than one taxon. Whew, so that's a mouthful. So using a population approach to do that. Then with Psilocybe cubensis, it's the same kind of thing. So looking at the population now with introduced and native species, they're pretty much chalk and cheese. So if you can imagine, if we introduce kangaroos to Canada, we introduce four kangaroos at any one point in the genome. We just look at one random nucleotide that's uh, homologous across them. So the same exact same position of the genome with four individuals, maybe we've got four bases there. In a native population, you generally have more diversity. In an exotic population or an introduced population, you'll have less. So you'll have fewer changes over time. You'll have just fewer, fewer differences in that founder population than in a population that where the center of origin of that organism is from. So chalk and cheese, when you have enough data, because with psilocybe cubensis, we might end up seeing, okay, well, there are only two alleles of this particular locus in the entire population that we've sampled from Queensland and New South Wales. 
Whereas psilocybe subaeruginosa, well, we've got 20 alleles of that particular, of that particular gene. So that's, those are the two questions. We're pretty sure that Cubensis is exotic and introduced. And what will be really interesting is to estimate how many times and if it's escaped um, from people importing spores and releasing them and saying you're free now, or whether it's from a single introduction that's spread all up and down the coast um, of the Eastern, Eastern Australia. Then because I'm working with genomic data, there's just so many questions. So a human genome fits on, takes up 3.2 gig, 3.1 gig on a memory stick. These, these genomes of psilocybe only take up 50 meg, meg, so 50 megabytes. They're 50 million base pairs. And in those 50 million base pairs, because there's so many genes that encode different things, whether it's production of psilocybin, whether it's their sexual reproduction, whether we can link them to growth rate, there's just so much to tease out over time. So we'll be studying all of those. So I'm just going to run you through what I do when I get a, a sample of psilocybe. And sorry, because Queensland right now, there's this prolific cubensis season. Um, most of my photos are going to be of psilocybe cubensis. So I will, uh, in 1% of cases, most of the time I'm working with spore prints, but I will, particularly with um, mushrooms that have a heavy blue stain, I will often, or not, I shouldn't say often, I will occasionally make a culture from their stem. So this is just cloning that genetic, that genetic variant so that we say, okay, well, this has already formed a mushroom in nature um, based on just how rapidly it's stained. I think I want to preserve this genetics in case anyone ever needs it for, for growing for an industry. And so it's so simple. I surface sterilize if, if anyone's worked with fungi before, I know that cane has, so I just do a quick surface sterilization because they've been sitting in cow manure and then put them on onto a culture plate. And maybe two or three days later, we'll just have this white mycelium coming out. And so from there, I can clean that up and that will be a diploid culture or a dicaryotic culture that can be used directly to produce a mushroom, which I would never do because that's not what my permit is for. With the majority of my samples, I'm working from spore material. So I'll do a spore print and then go from there. And this is just a 100 times or uh, spores under 1000 times magnification. And you can, this image is freely available on the old blog. You can do whatever you want with it. So from those spores, I'm trying to germinate them or I'm trying to get them as single spores to just get one copy of every chromosome in that in that single spore, which is the product of meiosis. It's like a sperm or an ovum. It just has one copy of each chromosome, whereas a diploid or a dicaryotic has two copies of each chromosome. So I do a 16 streak um, to try and really spread the spores out. Sorry, these are such dodgy photos just with my camera and because the culture lid has a lid on it, so it's not as fresh as it could be. But then this is also a couple of days old. I'll probably let these go a little bit long, but I'll take it when it's really, really small and I'll sub it onto a different plate and just get that haploid growth. And then I'll clean that up. And then that becomes the isolate. So a haploid culture just becomes an isolate. And I've just labeled them based on my own numbering system. When I've finished with them or when I think I've got too many cultures, then I put them into the herbarium and they get an official herbarium number. That number, technically, I'll probably keep them private just because of the nature of the specimens. But you could contact me and say, hey, Alistair, I'm, I want to research, you know, can you send me a list of all the cultures you have? I want to do my own research. Here's my permit. Um, we can set up a, an exchange. And then I say to the herbarium, uh, yeah, these people want to do some research on this partic these particular isolates. Then you'd have to set up an MTA, a material transfer agreement that, you know, and exchange it with the herbarium. That would be how it would work. If someone would ever commercialize it, it comes back to, like I was saying before, anything that goes into the herbarium, you technically need to enter it benefit sharing agreement with the Queensland government. So all collectors of mushrooms would be the recipient of that, that benefit sharing agreement or the landholder. 
Now, I don't know what that benefit is. And um, of the 24,000 cultures that we have in the herbarium, not a single one has been commercialized to, to give you an idea of, of what uh, the chances are of it actually happening. But, you know, I reckon this is the, the taxon or magic mushrooms are the thing that it might happen with. So not that I'm ever going to be the one to commercialize them because I'm an evolutionary biologist. Uh, so for all my genome work, I grow it up in PDA broth. So just to help it grow really quickly. And just because the DNA extraction is so much easier, we don't get this agar in the way. It can just be super clean. It can grow up real fast. And the extraction is just mm, kissy chef gesture, really high quality DNA. So right now, what I'm sitting on um, in my culture collection, I've got samples of Psilocybe cubensis. They're just so easy to get right now because the project started in July. So right at the end of um, the sub season, cubensis has really been the most majority of our sampling and people have sent me samples, which is really kind from Northern New South Wales. So I've got four populations essentially, or four sites separated by 100 kilometers and 36 haploid cultures. So far, I've only sequenced three genomes because I am more interested in Savaruginosa. And I'll just move my dome. There we go. Um, so Savaruginosa, which I only have sampled from two sites, but we've sequenced seven, seven of those genomes. One, I sequenced one from the dicarion. And this is because somebody gave me a mushroom that I couldn't get a spore print from. Um, Okay, this is just a little bit of information about the genomes themselves. So pretty much each of these circles is representative of the size. They all kind of look really similar. The size is underneath. So we've got cubes are the light green ones and then the teal deal is um, Psilocybe subaruginosa. And so this is essentially half a genome if you can, if you can imagine that it's one copy of each chromosome because they're haploids. So they're 38 meg for a psilocybe cubensis. And then this number in the middle um, is kind of a, a way, one way we can assess the quality of the genome. So if you had a human genome and we've got 23 chromosomes and you'd phased it so that each of each half of the chromosome had was its own was its own sequence. So you could say, okay, well, this is what Alistair got from his dad. This is what he got from his mum, and here's his mitochondrion. We would end up with a number here that's 23 plus 23. So 46 plus one from the mitochondrion, 47. It's probably the lowest you could get. Now with mushrooms and with fungi, you can have uh, anywhere between uh, nine to 18 chromosomes. I think 18 chromosomes in rust fungi, which have the largest fungal genomes. So getting this number down as small as we can means that we're getting closer to a chromosome scale assembly. So the smaller that number is, each puzzle piece is duplicated hundreds and hundreds of times. So it's, it's kind of really tricky. And when you've got two copies of each chromosome, then it becomes even trickier because the puzzle piece that can go into an extra copy. So that just kind of complicates things even more. So we're just making this big jigsaw puzzle, trying to get it down to this small, small number. And with small reads, short reads, which are 150 base pairs, the jigsaw pieces are really tiny. So what I'll do now is based on whichever one of these I think is the best assembly is I'll get really long reads and that will, that will help me is this is a carry-on is essentially what that's telling me. Um, now what I was, sorry, I'll just go back. What I was most worried about was working with my method, um, getting haploids and accidentally sequencing diploids because it's just so easy to get, it can like to not see a spore and have it grow and accidentally sequence two copies of each chromosome instead of one. So sequencing a diploid instead of a haploid. And this is a really good indication that I've gotten haploids where I thought I was getting haploids. My next worry, of course, was sequencing the wrong thing. I was pretty confident that, um, that, I'd, that I'd cultured psilocybe and thought I knew what a psilocybe culture looked like. But when the data came back, I was still pretty nervous. And so I was really relieved. So I just 
this is, I've just pulled out a barcoding gene essentially. So I'll just give a quick rundown for anyone who doesn't know. Essentially the fungal community uses uh, a piece of ribosomal DNA. Um, the ribosomal DNA is transcribed into a long piece of RNA. That RNA goes out of the cell and forms as a, as RNA, it binds with proteins to form a ribosome. And because ribosomes are so essential for producing proteins in uh, any sort of cellular function, that art piece of RNA, ribosomal DNA, is repeated over and over and over in the genome. So it's a really easy thing to amplify as a barcode. And what's worked out so wonderful for the fungal kingdom is that there's a little piece. So the ribosome, it's made, oh, I've got some accidentally, you know, a ribosome is like a figure bottom part. And the little piece of RNA that connects those two, which is often just cleaved out and forgotten and doesn't form a structural part of the ribosome, because it's not under any selection pressure to keep to produce proteins and keep a shape of a ribosome, it accumulates changes quite rapidly. And that's called the internal transcribed spacer. Um, and it's like going to Coles if you sequence this piece of DNA. Okay, so sorry if that's old knowledge as well. So this is a phylogenetic tree. One of the things about phylogenetic trees is that you immediately are trying to assume dichotomous evolution, and evolution is anything but dichotomous, um, as you can imagine. So what I've done is deleted, when I made this tree, which is just based on the ITS region, I've pulled off every psilocybe on GemBank, which is just all public data, and I've deleted any sequence that was exactly identical just to make the, just to make this tree. And I'm going to put this on the blog so you can really have a good look at this and it's going to have all the names on there, but just for a presentation, it can look so untidy. So what these little constellations are, this is pretty neat. This is within each of these colors. So I know that this one is Psilocybe subaruginosa. Um, this big circle represents how many sequences are literally or not literally sorry are the same and they're look judging it by a number of parsimony informative characters so these 30 sequences in here don't differ by any parsimony informative characters this one sequence differs by than a species rank um approach and that's just because so all my experience working with fungal taxonomy and with the its region in rust and smut fungi which are still basidio mycota this is just saying, hey, you could look at all the genes you want to and try and uh, try and get a meaningful taxonomy out of this, but it's just better to have a lot of sampling and work out who is exchanging DNA with who. So really looking at the boundaries of where sexual reproduction uh, has stopped and where it still occurs, and that's going to help uh, delimit species, in my opinion. Have a look at this at your leisure. It's going to be on the blog. Uh, it's it's similar. It's a similar way of viewing a tree. These networks, but really, it's just to to show uh, to visualize how many sequences could be in the tree. So if we included all thirty here, then this little line would be you know have to accommodate thirty sequences. So another way of visualizing data other than a tree, and if I do more talks when I have more data, then you're going to see a lot of these. These are called splits trees, and it's a way of visualizing complex data without a dichotomous hypothesis. So a tree, a phylogenetic tree, immediately constrains it to one hypothesis of evolution. With a splits tree, you're visualizing at once every single relationship among the data. It's based on distance, which phylogeneticists normally don't like, but because we're not making a single hypothesis and instead we're putting down every single possible relationship among the data, it's pretty neat. The more reticulation, and it takes practice understanding these, so don't worry if this is like an overload, especially if you've been um, learning from phylogenetic trees in the past. So these kind of, when you see this reticulation, it's a really good indication that you have sexual reproduction going on at some point in time. But when you have these long branches and then reticulation, it's so the branch length is still informative. So distance is, is still kind of helping you visualize how far apart things are. So we could go back to the tree. This is Hemii, Hugshagnii, Mexicana, uh, Samuiensis, so wherever they are in here. So we'll pretty much see a reflection of this topology, except you can really see 
um, every single relationship among the data instead of looking at it as a dichotomous hypothesis. Okay, so now just what I do want to do, I almost had this ready for you from the genomes, but I just couldn't finish it today. I want to look at how um, Psilocybe subaruginosa and cubensis mate. So with every haploid, I will eventually have, if we ever have to cross them, um, then we need to know their mating type and whether they're compatible. So this is just two haploid cultures and they've met up and they love life. They've, they've crossed that sexual reproduction on a plate. This one, on the other hand, you'll see they're like, no, get away from me. We're not interested. So there's no uh, compatibility between them. And so in Basidiomycota, you have a couple of different mating strategies. You've got similar to humans, you'll have a bipolar, which is like male, female. You've got to be compatible to meet up. And then to make it more complex, which is to stop outcrossing, so to, sorry, to stop inbreeding, they add another level. So you've got to be, you've got to differ at, uh, at two different loci. Uh, this is something that I was just working on today as well, just to show you what, what we could do with genomes. This is the gene for tryptophan decarboxylase. It's actually not just the gene, it's the entire contig. So a long, long piece of DNA, 155,000 base pairs. And what we can see is in our little population of subaruginosa, it is absolutely, absolutely identical. The gene itself is somewhere between 15,000 to 20,000 base pairs. These little, uh, these kind of things here, this little dark red is an indication of difference along that 155,000 base pairs. So there's not much variation in the populations that I've sampled of subaruginosa yet. And what's also interesting is that the sequences on GenBank for tryptophan decarboxylase are all uh, for subaruginosa and azorescens are identical to our population of subaruginosa. However, what's really interesting, and I'm sorry I haven't illustrated this, is that psilocybe cyanescens, its gene for tryptophan decarboxylase is different to our, our genomes. Mm, spine tingly dingly. Okay, getting to the end for those who are getting sleepy. Pretty much the biggest bottleneck to my project other than time is the sampling. So being able to uh, accept samples from people without putting you at legal risk. Um, I would, I would like help from the community, but I just do not want to put anyone at risk of the law for, for having a scheduled substance on account of science, even though I know that you have the best intentions. Um, it feels very unjust for someone to be penalized for having a mushroom that's growing naturally, even if it's in their backyard, but yeah, it's, for me, I don't want anyone to collect on my behalf, uh, essentially, unless we can, I don't know, unless there's a solution that someone can come up with. <laughs> All right. And that's me done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Alistair. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Alistair McTaggart, who will be taking your questions uh, now. And the first question I'm going to read in just a second and make myself uh, disappear. Uh, Kane is also online, just in case uh, we need to we need some Kane expertise. This question, I know with plants that they can drop genes into Arabidopsis and see what happens, but how do you test gene function in fungi? Ah. Uh. I love this question. Great question. You can do the same thing with fungi as well. So you can, you can technically express fungal genes, maybe not in the Arabidopsis. You could put them possibly in an Arabidopsis. If you can do the transformation going intra kingdom. So getting fungal genes expressed in plants is a little bit tricky just because of transcription factors and, and um, just that kind of inter kingdom kind of uh, making genes work. I was talking to a colleague at work just the other day. He's very experienced at expressing genes in Solanum, so in wild tobacco. And he's like, we should just put those five psilocybin genes into tobacco and see what we can do. People have expressed those five genes for psilocybin in bacteria. No doubt Saccharomyces at some point in time, if it hasn't already been done, I think the patents are there for it. And that would mean that you could technically, if they can get the 
uh, expression of those five genes going, then you could make a beer that produces psilocybin as well. So something that uh, ferments and produces psilocybin as a, as a byproduct, just because it's it's got those genes going. Um, another way that you can test genes is by phenotyping. So when psilocybin on my mycelium, so on my culture. I could say, okay, well, here's my gradient of psilocybin production in my cultures. We can now start to look for informative genes if the sampling is good enough. So if we have enough, um, essentially enough isolates, we can start to say, okay, all these isolates that have high psilocybin production have this allele or this SNP. All the ones that have low do not have that. We think that this particular point in the genome is responsible for high psilocybin content. So that's called a genome wide association study. You'll see it. It's often done in plants and whatnot. Is that, does that answer? All right. Well, it's up to our commenters to uh, tell us whether that answers or not. So if you feel like that answer, drop that, uh, drop that in the comments and um, we'll, we'll pass that on as well. Uh, we're going to move on to our next question. Please do keep them coming in on the, uh, on the YouTube chat, uh, on the YouTube chat. And thank you to those who have asked already. Uh, how can community members help with uh, psilocybe research? Is it possible for people to send you samples to assist with research? And I believe you pretty much answered that question right at the end of your talk there. Just once more. Uh, uh, for those in the back. Well, I so much want you to, but I just want to pass it over to Nick and Kane to give an anecdote about, about what can go wrong. Uh, Kane, do you, well, uh, do you want to, do you want to answer stop? this, Nick, or me? <laughs> well, uh, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little, just a little bit about um, legality of uh, psilocybe today. And actually, uh, what we do, um, I might just share uh, this with you right now. Really quick, uh, you might have been aware that the TGA, Therapeutic Goods Administration, had received an application for rescheduling of psilocybin from Schedule 9, the highest and most restricted uh, category, to Schedule 8, which allows, it still has a lot of restrictions, um, but it's where things like amphetamine, some of the amphetamines sit for medical purposes. So it's prescription only, um, highly monitored and uh, highly regulated, but is available uh, for many. It was November, uh, did not go through. We're not sure why. It's never, you know, it's never quite clear why. The reasons that they give might not be the, the full story. Uh, so Schedule 9 substances carry some pretty hefty penalties with them. Um, the penalties are listed in various different drugs and poisons uh, acts, uh, depending depending on what state you're in. Uh, Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act is what it is here in Victoria. Uh, it's different per state. The penalties are more or less the same and are listed in the... Um, uh, you, I mean, you can find information about that also in the... Um, the poison standard, which is monitored, uh, which is uh, administered by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and is generally accepted by all Australian states and territories. Uh, but uh, penalties uh, for psilocybin and it, psilocybin's a bit of a funny one because um, the way that they uh, that they work out penalties is by by different measurement rates of how heavy uh, a substance is, assuming that that um, what they're measuring is uh, is the drug that's that's scheduled. So for psilocybin they're going to be measuring mushrooms and counting all of that weight uh, as weight of psilocybin, um, which you and I know that that's not the case, um, but that's uh, irrelevant in the face of the law. And I have been in court cases before um, where judges and lawyers have been debating about the difference between drugs like DMT and MDMA, uh, sorry, DMT and uh, methamphetamine. They really weren't quite sure on the differences between these drugs. So this is the kind of education level uh, on drugs uh, that, that you're looking at when you're facing a court. Some are better than others. It really depends. And that's why if you ever are caught, do find a good lawyer who understands this stuff. Um, unfortunately, um, if you are within a particularly high category, you will almost instantly be um, arrested and uh, and jailed. Um, and this uh, high category can be very easy to reach. And we have a story uh, of a friend uh, in New South Wales, uh, who was in New South Wales, um, who was caught with a relatively small amount of mushrooms that was uh, considered to be a commercial quantity. So they were considering him to be a big time dealer, you know, running mushrooms across the, across the country, trying to destroy people's lives or whatever the narrative is that they think it is. And he spent some time in jail because uh, of of this uh, of this issue. So 
please be do aware. Uh, please be aware of the laws in your state, uh, in your territory. Um, just be aware that these things are still uh, are still illegal, and do support. Um, those who are working towards law change and not just law change uh, for medical purposes, although I think that is absolutely important, but there are still people every year who are arrested and who are jailed and who have their lives destroyed um, by uh, having a psychedelic. It's not many people. The numbers are in the single figures uh, here in Victoria. I'm not sure in other states. Um, so it's not something that the police are actively going and trying to, trying to you know, squash the psychedelic community. It's often just um, alongside other things that they might be investigating. Somebody yourself who's had their life destroyed. Um, Kane, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to, to add to that. Um, yeah, I am going to add. I'm just going to drop a couple of links into the chat for our mutual friend, uh, Daniel Witham, who, who the person that was we were referring to that got caught. Um, yeah, he had a very, very traumatic experience uh, with his present time and, you know, it's it's just... A very unpleasant story, uh, and now he has a he has a um, he's not allowed in New South Wales. There's a, an arrest warrant for him. So, um, so th those on P man would would be familiar. I I want specimens and I want the help of the community, but I do not want anyone to destroy their lives on account of science. So I've had people. Um, and I've spoken to them personally and, and that helped me say, okay, I'll, I'll take your spe specimen. It was pretty much uh, a guy who said, look, I'm collecting these no matter what. You can't stop me. I'm going to make a spore print. What's your address? And I gave him my address. And so technically he goes in as the collector. He still was happy to have his name associated with it. The spores don't contain psilocybin. Um, it's the risk of physically getting to those spores that is the thing that like, that's just so stressful for me uh, and the community collecting. One, I'll, I'll just add one more thing. As a member of the Queensland Mycological Society, if you go out on a foray with them, I think the membership costs $25 a year. They collect for research. You can collect with them uh, legitimately for research uh psilocybe so that's that may be one option to check with your local mycological society they're just such they're all just all such lovely people anyone who loves mushrooms just oh gosh we all just get on uh, next question. Thank you for dropping those in, uh, everyone who has asked them. Uh, Alistair, you've mentioned that you're not part of the psychedelic community. Do you think that gives you an advantage of a, as a researcher because as a community member, uh, because a community member may be more stigmatised? And I think, again, you sort of addressed this in your in your talk, but uh, maybe some elaboration. Oh, gosh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I have an advantage. I, unless you are talking about getting the actual permit, then that's probably helped a lot just because they can take a look at my track record and go, oh, okay, this guy has studied fungi. He's an evolutionary biologist. This is his proposal. And because I've been so open about what I want to do. So I think that helped a lot. And just having it in that mainstream environment. Um, the, yeah, the question is still, the scientific questions are the same as everyone's in the psychedelic community. It's just that I'm, I now have, like, if I go to work at the, where I am at the Queensland government, Keynes visited me there because we, all we do is culture fungi. I just have all of the resources. Now I have the permit. Um, it's just, it, that's an advantage. So being in an, in a lab, I can tell you that contamination doesn't happen when you've got a, when you have the facilities that I do, I can say that when I have the support of research behind me, if I want to try growing on a new media, then I don't have to worry. I, I have a collective group of people who are trialing different media all the time. And I can say, Hey, can I try growing this on, on whatever CMY PMG? I'm just saying random letters now. So that's an advantage, but, um, yeah, I have the same questions as you and yeah, that's, that's, I, I don't know if that answered it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the role of uh, of stigma can sometimes uh, play a role in in some decisions, but it really depends on you know who you're talking to and what's. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very broad question. Our next question uh, may be a bit easier. Are there any? The people who make the programs will have 
provided a set of resources that can really help you understand things, every other tax on at a particular point in time. And so all these kind of hypothetical relationships that you're dealing with, then when you move into populations, it becomes so mathematical. Um, <laughs> and it's all so much fun. Like I, yeah, it's really, really fun. Yeah. I'll jump in. Um, yeah, I would agree with YouTube. There's some great YouTube resources. There's some really good open courseware resources where you can look at uh, online courses. Um, where else? There's some Facebook groups, uh, fungal sequencing Facebook group, for example. Uh, and then, um, you can come along to the, my community applied mycology, mycology course that we're running and we'll give you an introduction to, to genetic, uh, some of the basic bioinformatics as well. Um, and I believe there are some people uh, in the comment section from uh, my community. So maybe if you guys can drop in uh, links to your upcoming events uh, so that anybody interested can get along to those, that would be fantastic. Our next question, uh, is there a model fungus for Arab... Di uh, Arab uh, I'll get you to say that, is for plants. Um, Alistair, pronunciations first. <laughs> So Arabidopsis, great question again, uh, and just knowledge of all the models. Um, Arabidopsis, a great model for plants. In fungi, we've got a couple. It just depends on which subphylum you're in. So if you're in Ascomycota, a really common model is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, the yeast to, to make beer with. In uh, Basidiomycota, you'll have Cryptococcus, which is a human pathogen. You'll have things like Lacaria which is just an ectomycorrhizal mushroom. Often it's, uh, they'll be linked to something like a pathology. It'll be something that can be grown easily. So we do have model organisms, even in more complex systems, like in rust fungi, there's almost a model just because so many people work on it and that's wheat rust. Um, yeah, so we do have models. Fantastic. Um, um, uh, it sounds uh, very uh, interesting. So I'm just getting up our, our next question as it's coming through. Um, maybe I'll just take a quick moment. I would like to get your hands on one of these special IsWas EGA uh, T-shirts. The code is down here. Um, it's Deck Sale, December Sale. Um, only available during December. IsWas has been a long-time supporter of EGA, uh, doing a lot of the artwork uh, for EGA. So some of the banners that you would have seen, uh, many other T-shirts shirts in the past as well uh, and some artwork as well in the um in in the journals that have been produced for ega so it's a really uh really nice to talking before and we think it's uh one of the best ones yet um i've added it to my cart so i'm going to do that after we're finished tonight uh but let's go back uh to our questions and our next question um alistair how did you become a mycologist um this person this question asker is currently studying a bachelor of science ecological biology and is wanting to to uh, specify in mycology. Could, do you have any advice? Yeah. Hey, oh gosh. Good. Good on you for wanting to do mycology because we need to get to critical mass. Australia, it's, it's tricky just because there are so few of us doing it. Um, the way that I got in, which was, which is going to be different to the way that you get in. I started volunteering at a herbarium and because it was because so many fungal fungi are agricultural pathogens, that was the trajectory that I went. So I did a PhD in smut fungi. And when I went to America to start working over there, it was like a caveman being introduced to fire with how large the community is and the knowledge that they hold. And I started taking mycology classes there. And that was when it really clicked for me, like fungal life cycles in particular and genetics. When I lived in South Africa as well, a huge community of people working on fungal genetics. And so we have groups in Australia who work on fungi. A lot of the time it's to do with agricultural pathogens. Um, it's You need to find the right mentor. Often in undergrad, it'll be like there won't, there'll be one or two courses where that maybe can be linked to linked to mycology in some way. Joining the mycological society, your local mycological society is also the best way just to start learning the local species. If you do want to start getting more in-depth knowledge, then yeah, you need to kind of take it a bit further. The career trajectories for mycology, that's the other thing that you want to be mindful of. 
So anytime you're doing biology, you're probably going to be analyzing big data now because we're in an age of genomics. So you'll either, you'll either enjoy being in the field, maybe in front of the computer or in the lab um, in biology. And so you need to kind of find a happy medium of where you fit in. Mycologists, you know, we spend one month in the field to get all of our, our data for the year, um, which is just a reality of collecting and, and how, how many samples you can get all at once. Uh, good luck. Send me an email if you want to know more because I, I want to help you badly. I wish I could help you more. I, we can brainstorm people who you can ask and whatnot. Uh, There's also um, pathways, I think, through citizen science to some degree. You know, as you're saying, Alistair, getting out and volunteering with different groups, becoming known with with mycologists for, you know, getting out there doing iNaturalist, uh, maybe doing some citizen science DNA work um, can, can kind of get you known. Uh, and then also just... I guess other ways of getting into things like cultivation of edibles, other things like that, uh, and then and then just trying to work your way into the academic system that way. And I think it's also a, a good reminder that connecting with communities like uh, like EGA uh, can also help to uh, find the others, to find uh, people from uh, unique and different paths. It might not always be mycology, of course, uh, at EGA, uh, but you might find somebody who knows somebody as well. Um, so, you know, we really appreciate that you've uh, you continued to turn up to these webcasts uh, and we look forward to seeing you at in-person events um, where networking is um, definitely one of the... Uh, one of the one, one of the dra one of the draws of uh, of such events. Um, I think this might be our final question. Unless anybody else would like to drop a question in the chat, um, we uh, we will wrap it up after this one. So, final questions. This is your final question call now. Um, here is the uh, question that we have. How hard was it, Alistair, to get um, the permit to collect uh, these mushrooms? Again, I think you kind of addressed this in your talk, uh, but it's good to good to cover these things and, and elaborate a little bit if if people are asking. A lot of effort. I think if um, if it wasn't in Queensland, it would have been even harder. I would call, I would go on these massive phone loops, like of getting forwarded to people and forwarded to someone else. And then it would ring out and I would try the next day, the exact same thing. And eventually I, I got through to the people that I needed. Now I know them directly. So it's, it's a, a bit easier to start, to start conversations with them, but it is, it is hidden when they assessed it. Like, obviously they'd never had anything like it or maybe they had in the past that the, these current people hadn't. And I think um, it was a little bit weird because I'm not working on psilocybin. I'm working on the mushrooms that produce it. So, yeah, it, it was smoother than I thought. And I should add that because I was at a research institute, UQ, it, it probably made it easier and gave me a bit of legitimacy. Well, thank you for answering that. And I'm just going to join Kane over here. Hi, Kane. Just joining you. A small version of me, but um, I think that's our last question. It looks like nobody else has uh, got any more questions. Thank you very much for all of your questions tonight uh, and for joining us on our 10th edition of this webcast. And thank you very much to uh, our presenters, Kane, who is right beside me here, um, and uh, Dr. Alistair McTaggart, who you can get in contact with uh, as well. Um, Alistair, I think uh, you had some information on those slides, but maybe if we can get our moderators to drop uh, in your uh, a, 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 a way to connect with you, whether it's a URL or I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure actually, um, please do drop that in because um, it's good for people to be able to connect uh, and find uh, that information out. So thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, tonight. And I'm just going to cross back over here. Um, and I just want to say, I mean, this is our last web stream uh, for the year. Uh, we are wrapping it up after a very busy uh, December with our December 5th event, 12 hours of uh, live webcasting and it was the first time that we had actually all gathered together uh, in person to be able to put something together which uh, threw up some new challenges but was also um, a really enjoyable experience and I really want to say a big thank you to Jonathan Carmichael um, who is uh, head honcho here at EGA uh, he hosted us for the day um, and he organised all sorts of things like catering for example it's the little things, keeping everyone fed keeps everyone happy and it was um, some good food 
food uh, from a local supplier there in Belgrave. Um, and it was really good to see, um, you know, a, sm- a small part of the EJ community, which you're obviously also a part of, um, uh, yeah, a small part of the EGA community in person once more and looking forward to being, being able to do that again um, and, and seeing that part of the EGA community as well that is core and essential uh, to keeping everything going, uh, every, everything from the, the background administration of things like the, the website, um, the uh, board executive members who keep all of the, you know, the, the governance uh, and the financials uh, going because uh, EGA is a registered uh, not-for-profit uh, not for, not for organisation, so if you make any donations, um, then those uh, those are tax deductible as well. Um, it's a it's a registered charity. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into registering a charity, and uh, a lot of people um, who aren't you know, aren't necessarily going to see uh, on screen because uh, often you find that people who like to do that background work don't like to be uh, in front of screens and vi- vice versa. There's a bit of crossover, um, but uh, yeah, uh, often it's you know we we have a lot of specialization. It's a big community, and that specialization helps us uh, to be able to produce um, this and the the much bigger uh, outdoor events um, that again I, I don't know when an outdoor event. Geez, I should get Ronnie on the uh, on the uh, on the video to ask an impromptu question about outdoor events, but we won't because Garden State's 2022 is what we're working towards. Um, so I want to wish everybody a, a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays. How have you celebrated? Make sure to stay safe. Make sure to I don't know slip slop slap. Are we still slip slop? Of course we're still slip slop slapping. I just haven't heard any ads about that uh, for a while because, you know, been sitting in houses for a, a long time and maybe not getting as uh, sunburnt, but um, I expect a lot of people might be going to beaches over the, uh, over the uh, uh, coming months. Um, also, a quick reminder... In January, we'll be back after a break, after a much-needed break uh, for the EGA and PRISM, working with PRISM, the Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine organisation, to uh, present Be More Tree Psychedelic Nature Codes featuring Dr Roz Watts and Dr Stephen Bright and Melissa Warner, who are both from Mind Medicine... uh, Sorry, (laughs) uh, who are both from PRISM Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine. Um, I think I was just thinking of another... Other thing that uh, TGA decision, um, which you can read in full, um, both the proposal uh, that was put forward uh, and the decision. Uh, unfortunate that it hasn't moved forward, but um, these things do tend to take a long time, and it's not the first time uh, that there has been a fairly reasonable sounding proposal that's been put to the TGA uh, that has um, not gone ahead. Um, there is a bit of a history of them. Maybe that's uh, something that we could do in the future. I'm just thinking off the top of my head that there's been at least two or three ones for rescheduling DMT uh, for both religious purposes and for uh, scientific uh, research um, that have not gone through. Um, So even though I I know it's frustrating and it looks like a reasonable application, there's probably other things going on behind the scenes that we're just not aware of. um, And, you know, it would be good to good to know but it's really it's really hard to know with these sorts of processes so thank you very much for joining us uh again subscribe to youtube keep uh, up to date with ega uh, by going to the website and signing up for that newsletter and we'll see you in january